You're here tonight to hear about the camper van experience. Um, and we, uh, we actually are completely full. We have 100 participants here, and that is as many as our current Zoom account allows. Um, so you're all here to hear Christy, Christy and Randy, who last year went to Vegas and spent a week traveling through southwestern Utah in a rented camper van. And they wanted to check out how they liked it and explore Southwest Utah and be off the grid. They went through a process for choosing the, the van and they did it remotely and um, looked at all of the pros and cons and looked at helpful apps and websites and what to pack and, and basically how to live in the small space. So they're gonna give us all of their tips and everything that, that they learn. We're gonna benefit from their research and their experience. Christy and Randy are longtime rovers. They met on a cross country ski trip uh, in the Superior National Forest. And for the past 22 years, they've been doing adventures together down whitewater rivers and exploring the boundary waters and skiing in the Canadian Rockies and uh, snorkeling and hiking to mountaintops in Colorado. And, um, and now they're looking at uh, other kinds of things to add to their bucket list and get out for future adventures. So Christy and Randy, take it away and tell us about camper vans. All right, everyone, thanks so much for um, coming out tonight, I guess. <laughs> Good to see you all. <laughs> um, we are gonna talk to you about, as Fran mentioned, camper vans. So um, welcome, as I said. Um, I, I just wanna state a few things first that we are not experts on camper vans. This is our first time renting a camper van. We do own a van, <laughs> but it's not the same. Um, not but a van. it's not a camper van. <laughs> but um, but we th but in the process of renting one, and we've been looking at camper vans. And gosh, you know, do we want to get a camper van? Maybe do we want to get a um, a, a, a pull behind camper? Um, we're not interested in living in a camper van. I think. That's great for some people. Um, we just have too much stuff. Um, <laughs> we'd have to have too many camper vans. Um, but um, so, but we just want to share our learning of what we've learned with with you all. Just some little logistics about the presentation. I'm going to go through kind of um, first, just talking about the camper van and how we got there, how we picked it. Um, specifications of the camper van, things like that, because I know some people are interested in that. And then once we get through all of that, um, I'm also we'll talk about oh, we'll show a few pictures from our of scenery from our trip, um, and then we'll have questions afterwards. So if you have any questions, burning questions, just write them down or put them in the chat. All right. So first question is why Las Vegas and why Utah? Um, well, we had a uh, resort timeshare weekend package that we had to use up before it expired. Thanks to COVID, we were going to go in, um, actually on the East Coast in uh, May of 2020, and that didn't happen. And then um, it, it was a timeline, so I thought, okay, we got to use that up. And then, then we also had um, a companion airline ticket to use before that expired. Again, thanks to COVID, so we had a, a Gosh darn it, we have to travel. So we got a round trip, trip, uh, round trip um, ticket to Las Vegas. And we thought, well, gee, while we're in Las Vegas, you know, Utah's not that far. We've never been to Utah. So why not combine the two? Why not and check out also a camper van, which is what we've been wanting to do. So that is exactly what we did. So our goals for our trip were to explore parts of Southwest Utah, See how we liked living in a camper van and living off the grid. Um, so, whoops, sorry, get a little trigger happy. The dates of our the camper van part of our trip was uh, Sunday, September 26th to Monday, October 4th. The rental place that we went uh, rented from was not open on Sunday, so we extended our trip to Monday so that we could have extra time. I didn't want to end it on a Saturday and um, have to drive back on Saturday. And so we had a full weekend. 
extra weekend, which is great. So how did we select the camper van? So we, we had a couple of criteria. We wanted a vehicle that we could stand up in. Randy's six feet. So that was important. Um, we wanted a vehicle that we could cook our meals inside. And we also wanted to have solar power and um, unlimited miles was a, was a perk for us as well. So the process that we used to um, find a camper van, we did um, a lot of looking online, extensive searching online for camper vans in the Las Vegas area. And then these are some of the websites that we used. Um, a couple of them like Outdoorsy and Rev, RevZ and RV Share, they um, are sites that are kind of aggregate. Um, there's, you, can, you can list your own camper van um, uh, for rent on that. So there are a lot of different um, camper vans. Um, we ended up going with, um, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So there's lots of styles of camper vans. You can sleep there somehow where you can sleep up on top of the vehicle. Others have a kitchen on the outside on the back of the vehicle. Um, somehow at, you can access the area, the living area from the front. So you just turn around in the driver's seat and there you are. You don't ever have to go outside um, if it's raining. And then some have um, you, you drive in the front and you have to get out and walk around to the side and access from the outside. Um, some have toilets and showers, some have just showers, some have just have toilets, and some don't have any. So we decided on what's called the Kuga camper van from Traveler's Auto Barn. It's a company located in Las Vegas. Um, it's a Chevy Express camper van. The interior was um, had been updated in 2019-2020. It had a full kitchenette, fridge, gas cooker, microwave and sink, had interior lights that were, um, that were uh, fueled by the, the solar panels that were up on top of the, of the um, up here, you can't see it, I don't have pictures of it, whoops, but there's, uh, but right up here <coughs> on the top of the camper van were the solar panels. So when you drive around, um, that was great. Perfect for a sunny environment. Right? Oops, sorry, something happened with my screen. Um, so the solar panels, we would recharge the lights and the refrigerator. And then other perks were free unlimited miles. There was also, a, they had a full free uh, service number in case something happened or you had issues with the van, 24 seven roadside assistance, free road atlas and um, a free campground app. So this is what the van looks like. You would access the, access ours, you access from the outside. Um, it can it can sleep free. There's a bench. There are bench seats in the back that that fold down to make a double bed, and then there's a platform that you can pull down on the um, on on the top on the upper level, um, and you can make a second bed. We didn't do that, but there is that option. And this one does not have a toilet or a shower. So for those who are into um, gearheads of vehicle gearheads. Here are some specifications. It's an automatic, either a V6 or V8. Uh, unleaded fuel had about 31 gallons. It got about 13 to 15 miles per gallon. It drove really smoothly, you know, it's a, um, and pretty easily. So we didn't have any problems. It didn't feel like we were just driving a big tank. But it was, it was definitely not overpowered. It, um, it lagged a little bit on the long uphills, uh, but it was able to get up everywhere, no, no problem. Uh, it just wasn't going quite as fast as some of the other surrounding cars on the, on the road. So we got to linger and look at the stage, at the, at the, um, the view longer. We, ha we had power steering, which is awesome. We, uh, there was a dual battery power supply, um, um, and, but the power supply, you had to have a hookup if you wanted, if you had to go to a campsite and they had a hookup. Um, some of the other, like I mentioned before, that. Uh, it sleeps two to three people. There's, there is air conditioning, but only in the cab, only up front here. Um, and while you're driving, there's a water tank and a rooftop solar panel and, um, and, oh, and a fire extinguisher. That's always important. 
So here's the inside of the van. It's a double bed. It's about six feet by five feet, six inches wide. So six feet this way, five in this way. And it worked fine. Randy had to sleep on the diagonal, but um, it worked fine. The van itself was, you know, it was 18 and a half feet long, six, a little over, almost seven feet wide and um, a little over 10 feet high, the whole van top. Um, we, there, here's the, what the bed looks like when it's all laid out. There, this company has an optional living equipment package, which includes sleeping bags, pillows, sheets, towels, et cetera. Um, for $45, we chose that so that we didn't, since we're flying, we didn't want to have to lug a lot of stuff with us. That's $45 a day. No, it was $45 total. Oh, yeah. It was not, <laughs> don't miss it. Yeah. Um, it was just $45 total. Um, and then here's a view of the, from the, looking into the van to give you an idea of the the space and and what it looked like and storage and things like that here's the microwave and the refrigerator microwave and the sink cabinet um this right here you may be wondering why is there a bandana hanging down here in the middle well when you're walking from the inside to the outside you tend to forget that there's this nice white hard plastic um Bulkhead. Bulkhead here. And once, after you hit your head, not once, but twice, you realize, hmm, got to do something about that. So this was our, our safety um, head uh, keeper. <laughs> Saver. Saver, I guess. Yeah. Uh, the kitchen sink overlooked the front seats. So it was a nice open area. Uh, we never, like, you, you can't be in the back when the vehicle's moving. But when we, like, if we were prepping for a trip before we left, you know, and we're packing up stuff. It was a quick, easy way to kind of just shove your backpack and other things like that up into the front seat without having to constantly run in and out and in and out. That was nice. Or, you know, you make a sandwich and drop it down to the driver. Here you go. Thanks for driving. And you could grab things easily if you didn't think about it ahead of time. You could, while you're driving, you could reach on, reach behind you, grab something off the shelf. The passenger could do that, not the driver. <laughs> Anyway, so here's the kitchen. Our little kitchenette here is a gas stove and the microwave, which has to have an electric hookup for, and the little refrigerator. And this is the storage cabinets. Here is the utility area. Um, so there's a solar meter right here, tells you how you're doing with your solar. So you kind of watch that. And when it gets too low, you know that you have to go and, and do a hookup. Uh, we could go probably about three to four days, I think, um, before we had to at least get to a um, campsite that had elect an electrical hookup and water. We built. And this right here, this little button is the water pump switch. And this is really important because number one, you need water. But number two, you need to remember, we had to remember to turn it off because if you leave it on, it actually just runs kind of quietly in the background and it will drain your batteries completely. So um, just something to kind of think about. We actually had a little sticky note on the door that said water pump off. <laughs> um, so yeah, this is the under sink storage. There's just, I, I was pleasantly surprised. I didn't know really what to expect um, when we were looking. And one of the reasons I thought of sharing some of this information is because when we're looking online, uh, you don't see, they don't show you the details like this. They show you, you know, how great the van looks in nature, which is wonderful because, you know, I want to be there. I think, gosh, I could visualize myself there, but I want to know the nuts and bolts about um, where am I going to put the food and do I have to have a separate case or bag or something for, you know, you know, and I didn't want to have to be schlepping paper bags around all the time. So it was really a pleasant surprise to see that these shelves do not come out, but we had plenty of space for our food and water. We had bottled water and then these bottles we would refill. We saved them and then we would refill them in campsites or at locations where we could um, refill the water. Here is our microwave. Sorry, this is kind of crooked picture. Um, here's our microwave. It was a great storage for bagels and bread. <laughs> we didn't want to- We never used it. <laughs> we never used it. Um, we didn't need to use it, but it was a great storage container. Um, and the small fridge, which ran off the of solar, could actually pack quite a bit in there. And it had a tiny little freezer. 
um, in here. And as you can see, the condensation. So this is, you know, a challenge with these types of vehicles when you're driving or when you're you're when you're not hooked up to electricity all the time. You're it's a constant freeze thaw cycle. So we had these vegetables, <clears throat> frozen vegetables. I had this brilliant idea for our meals. Gee, a way to get fresh vegetables and augment our, with our meals, you know, well, why don't we get some frozen veggies and we can just pour them in. And that was a great idea in theory, <laughs> but in reality, um, because of this freeze, freeze thaw cycle, they sometimes clumped together and they would be really hard to break them apart. And, and since they were frozen, when you threw them into your, we had, you'll see in a moment, we had dehydrated uh, meals for our dinners. So when you heated the water and you put the cold um, vegetables in there, well, you can guess, you know, boom, right away it chilled, it, our, our dinners got chilled down. So we, we, we created a workaround for that, but. Yeah, you can go back to that. Yeah. And one more thing about these uh, refrigerators is the very back of the refrigerator uh, is very cold back there. That's where the cooling elements are apparently. And uh, we had a few things in the refrigerator portion that were in the back and blocked in with some plastic bags and so on. Those things uh, partially froze. We had some vegetables that partially froze on us. Um, so. Um. So, and here's the, the front cab um, and our handsome driver. Uh, and um, <laughs> um, stop laughing. <laughs> and, but you can see some of the storage spaces and here's some of the storage in the in-between storage in the door, on both doors. It was just everywhere. There was just storage. It really had a lot of space. These are the bench seats. That, there were two bench storage cabinets on either side of the van. Very big, very roomy. Um, so this is on the one side, it had all kind of utility things, which was the water hose. So when you, would, when you did have to go and get a hookup, you hook this up and then get fresh water coming into the into your water tank. This is the the plug that you used for the electrical um, connection. And then um, there was also a broom and pail for if you needed to clean anything. This was the battery storage over here. Um, extra battery. That's extra, battery. extra battery. That's the extra battery storage. And um, yeah. You have anything to say to that because I don't know anything uh, about that. Just the it's the storage for the solar uh, solar panel. Uh, the power comes into the solar panels goes into that battery. It's that battery charge and that's what everything that runs off of solar runs off of that battery. All right. So there is also a large storage area over the um, the bulkhead uh, of the of the cab here, and that's where we put. We had a one really huge. Uh, suitcase and another big suitcase that we stowed in the back. And then we also stowed our, um, our, oops, here, we stowed our backpacks and things like that um, in this, in this area. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it just add, added a lot to the storage area. And uh, you could get at that very quickly and easily if you wanted to. So it didn't have to be a storage area that, you know, that you, you know, don't have access to frequently. And then this was the exhaust fan right here. This, um, the thing on the top here. Um, sorry, my person there, right here. And then we would just run that when we would cook our meal, but we would make sure that we turned it off. Um, and of course, close the hatch when before you drive, because you don't want that. And if you did, rumor has it, if you did drive off, you'd know right away because you can hear there's a loud noise and, and you can hear like, da, 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 da. so you don't want to do that. All right, so here's storage from the back. We had one of our suitcases in the back. If we needed to, we could have had storage underneath um, the beds if we, when we had the beds down. Internal height, as I mentioned, Randy's about six feet. So it, the internal height's about six, five. So we had plenty of, you didn't have to stoop the whole time. Um, there's also a large storage head storage area over the back part of the, over the, the bench seats. And this is where we stored all of our pillows and bedding and um, sleeping bags and things. They gave us these nice sleeping bags um, uh, as blankets. And then you can set up the table and then you can sit inside and have a nice, wonderful meal. So 
I bet some people are thinking, I want, how, how big is it? And what is the living space like? Well, it's a little cozy, especially when you have the bed down. So um, you really have to know the person well <laughs> with whom you're sharing the van. Um, and when we were cooking, we actually kept the, we ended up keeping the bed down. It just was easier rather than, you know, putting all the, the stuff away and putting the, the cushions back and then, and we just thought, you know what, we just want to get up and get, go hiking. And then by the time we get back, it's dinner time. And then we're going to go to bed. And then, you know, <coughs> so we didn't want to have to work. We're on vacation. So we left it down. But as you can see, if you're standing here and you need to get over here to get something because you're chopping up lettuce or salad for the refrigerator, for the set, chopping up stuff for your salad and you need to get to the refrigerator and someone's here cooking, you had to kind of do a little dainty dance of getting around and maneuvering. So, but we survived. So um, since we were also uh, traveling, we wanted to maximize efficiency, not only for space in the van, because we weren't sure of you know, how much space, especially in the refrigerator we'd have and for air travel. We also didn't want to have to be, um, feel like we had to run out to the store. We knew we were going to be in some remote areas and we wanted to be able to stay there. So what we did was we, um, all of our meals, all of our dinners were dehydrated meals that we had um, tested out ahead of time. And then I um, purchased those meals and other bulky items that we were going to take out with, take on the trip with us. I purchased them at REI in Vegas, in Las Vegas, and picked them up when we were there. And that worked really slick. Another bonus of this was that it was really easy meal prep. Um, Clean up with a breeze, and we used less water. We didn't have any pots to clean. We just had to boil water, just like backpacking. And then we also brought, um, we got these handy um, little extra protein packages of, of meat, beef, chicken, and sausage from Midwest Mountaineering. And um, I, so we took them with us, but these were really handy to have because some of the meals, sometimes we felt we just needed a little extra protein for ourselves. And then also for um, maximizing efficiency, we everything that we had, everything was in, in packing cubes. I wanted to have everything containerized, be able to put it somewhere. We didn't want to have loose bags flopping around. Um, so that was great. I had, I've heard people talking about packing cubes in the past. And I always thought, oh, yeah, I don't know. Ugh, I'm a convert. I love them. I went out and bought a whole bunch more. So also for maximizing efficiency for space and travel, we did not have a toilet and we were hoping to be, you know, we we're going to be visiting um, uh, different spaces on places on, in, on the Bureau of Land Management gr grounds, um, possibly going off road in um, the Grand Staircase, and we would not have access to bathrooms. So we were thinking, hmm, what are we going to do? So we looked around and what we did do is we ended up buying online this handy dandy little collapsible toilet that fits in a large suitcase. It weighs up just shy of four pounds. And then we also brought our, we made sure to bring our little, if you've never used these little hand soap sheets, oh my gosh, I'm, I've had, I actually, tra I've traveled with these. I traveled to Europe with this and I don't think I ever used it once. And now I'm like, how did I ever live without this? Because these things are amazing. So here is our, um, our uh, little toilet, um, collapsible toilet that we had. It you know collapses up, it comes with a, a, a large plastic bag. You can also get, um, you can buy specific WAG bags. I'll talk about those in a moment to go inside. Um, and then you can just, just it collapses in it has a little floor sorry i didn't do a video of setting it up but it it has a little lid here the lid doesn't stay up it just flops down but it closes so that you know you know why um and 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 as advertised it can also be used as a cooler or a bucket for drinks I'm not sure if you want to do that. I think I think you'd want to change. Well, obviously, you know, that's if you hadn't used it for other uses or uh, so if you never used it for its intended purpose, there's lots of other uses um, for that as well. Um, so and if it doesn't fit in your suitcase, it, because it's so handy and it's so light, it can be carried on on the plane as your number two briefcase. That's what our 
um, ours got dubbed. So, but in the end, we actually didn't need to use the number two briefcase. And I'll explain a little bit more about that, why. So these are, here are um, various different types of wag bags and wag bags, for those who don't know, are waste alleviation and gelling is what wag bag stands for. So we ended up taking actually these two types with us, clean waste and the Biffy bag. Here's the clean waste It comes in the package and it all comes out, I'll show you it later. And then this is the, the Biffy bag, you tie it around your waist and um, it's a little cumbersome. And um, there were some negative reviews online and um, I can see why. It works, but it's cumbersome. And if you've got to go really fast, it, um, it, anyway. There's a question in the chat about, uh, could you talk about your decision not to go with a toilet in the RV since you're kind of on this topic? Sure, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, we decided that there's a, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, uh, there weren't, um, what the time that we were looking, I think we started, we decided, so we went in the end of September and we started planning our trip in May. I think we bought our ticket in May and we reserved the camper van. So I started looking for the camper vans in May. And, um, you know, this is still in the height of the pandemic and camper vans are really super popular. They still are. And there weren't a lot of camper vans available. Um, especially ones that did have a bathroom um, for the time that we wanted to have, uh, that we wanted to, to um, go. Also, the price points are, are, um, are, are different. Um, ours was about $139 a day. And the ones with the toilet, if you wanted to, to, um, uh, to, to, to rent one of those, those are start at anywhere from about $250 to about $350, $350 a day. So um, times that by 11 and yeah. So um, so that's one of the reasons why it was, one was a cost, but mainly two, it was, it was, um, it, uh, um, oh, and we wanted solar. So we, so it, it, some of the things just didn't tick off all of our, 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 um, our boxes and solar was more important than a toilet. So um, we figured we could, figure it out and we did. So um, the toilet wasn't as important. All right, so these are, um, here's the, this is just, for those who aren't familiar with wag bags, so these can be either used in, um, this brand can either be used in, in a portable toilet or you can also um, just have them and use them out on a trail if you needed to or if you're backpacking. Um, so they come with a little bit of, here's a little thing of um, tissue, of toilet paper. It has a little hand wipe if you want. And then there's two bags. There's one bag, the larger bag that has a, a, a powder in it, that a powder that turns into gel and liquid is, is added to it. And then another bag that has um, a zip. So the, the, the dirty bag folds up into the uh, second bag so that can either go in that can go into your pack if you're backpacking we took them on day trips and they were very very handy because um one of the things i had learned about um i had been reading about um i i just thought well you know we'll just dig a cat hole or something well, not in utah and not in the desert southwest um i even talked to someone at in the bureau of land management office out there and they said no we really don't want you doing that they didn't Number one, it's the, the, the environment is, um, it's so fragile, the environment out there. It's so dry, it's fragile. Number two, you can just leave your trowel at home. I mean, it's rock. So even a hard pick would be, you know, I mean, unless you're gonna carry a hard pick, it's, it's finding dirt to dig is not an easy thing to do. So, um, and they really want you to pack it in, pack it out. So if, um, so, um, so we did, we, um, use those on a couple of hikes and that was um it was great to have them along all right so dispersed camping dispersed or off-grid camping dispersed or off-grid grid camping is just as it says off-grid there's no hookups for water for electricity bathrooms you're it's um you're you're just self-supported i'm gonna go through a few pros and cons here 
some of the pros while well, you get to wake up and see a view like that. Um, it's free. Camping is allowed on um, public lands and Bureau of Land Management and uh, US Forest um, Service lands, as long as it's not posted, no camping, and that there are other activities that would conflict with the camping. Um, you can also camp in less populated places. Uh, you want to get away from people, just be, or, you know, it also allows for a lot of flexibility and last minute planning, which is good for people like us who hold off to the last minute. <laughs> and you can stop when you get tired. You can stop whenever you want. You can stop when you get tired. You can stop if you're hungry. We did that a couple of times um, where we would just be driving and uh, we just stopped for dinner in a beautiful location, had dinner, and then just kept on going. Um, and, and then you can eat in beautiful locations. And no reservations are needed. You just find a, a spot to pull over and that's your place to sleep. All right, some of the cons. Um, some access roads can be really, really rough and you need a four wheel drive. They may be down um, either um, some dirt roads, if you're familiar, you know, some dirt, there's like dirt roads, there's minimal man maintained roads, and then there's just pure hell roads that are all full of boulders and sand and whatnot. And you can get a mix of all of those um, when you're going uh, um, on for dispersed camping. A lot of times the roads that we've seen are hard packed dirt, but some of the um, some of the descriptions of the places that we were thinking about going, I read about on one of the apps that we had, and people would talk about the big boulders in the middle of the area. And since we had a rented camper van, um, we just weren't really comfortable um, going down some of those places because um, we're more willing to take a risk with our own vehicle than with with a rental vehicle on that. Um, for some people, the con might be that there's no facilities or electricity or water. You got to, you really have to plan ahead. So with a vehicle like this, you're able to um, go several days, two, three, maybe four days uh, without replenishing anything if you, um, if you don't use water, a lot of water quickly. So you're semi-self-sufficient in this kind of a vehicle. Also, um, a lot of rental companies, rental cars, as well as rental vans, um, they, they have very strict, uh, no dirt roads with the rental companies. Some, some will say no dirt roads. Some will say, you know, just they have it in their contract and ours at first didn't have it, but it later I read it and it was like, Oh, absolutely no dirt road. And if anything happened, um, one of the, the guy at the rental place told us that he said, you know, tow trucks just they don't want to go down and, and have to retrieve people from some of these places. So that's another reason why they don't want people going. But also the roads are rough in Utah, off-road stuff. So, And then another con when you're renting a camper van, it, camper van is that you have to return home. That's always the worst part. Um, so there's some helpful apps that we have that we found. Um, some of these, the dirt is a real popular one, Campendium. Some of you may know some of these boondockers, um, park advisor, they list commercial campgrounds as well as some um, US Forest Service and BLM dispersed campgrounds. And then helpful websites, the Bureau of Land Management and looking at the area specifically for where you're going, even calling the office and talking to the people, they're great. They give great information. The US Forest Service um, also, on their website has great information about uh, dispersed camping. And um, recreation.gov is another one. Um, you can search for dispersed camping. I always, I was a little surprised when I was searching and I found someone on recreation.gov because I always thought that it was, you know, when you reserve your campsites, but they also list them since they work, um, since they have some of the campsites for the, the federal government, for the Forest Service and such. So, anyway, so. The big question, how much does it cost? So for us, our cost, our total cost of the camper van, and this is just for the rental of the vehicle, it does not include gas um, and things like that. But the cost for the rental of the vehicle was $1,488 for, for 11 days. So it came out to about $135 a day. This included insurance. 
uh, insurance. I called our insurance agent before we went because it asked if you, on the application, when you're filling it out online, they asked if you had insurance. So I thought, hmm, I'm going to check with my, my insurance agent. It's always good to ask your insurance agent, I think, because I thought, yeah, yeah, it'll be, it's a van, it will be covered. And he said, oh, this is a gray area. And he said, it's kind of an area that a lot of people in the insurance company scratch their heads about. So he said, I would take the, the insurance. Um, and my insurance guy usually tells me, don't take the insurance. So when he tells me to take the insurance, I listen. And I think our insurance was about $25 a day. And he thought that was a really good price. Um, the, it also included, we, we paid for a, a, a propane tank refill just so we didn't have to think about it because we knew we'd be getting back just before our flight um, uh, would take off and we didn't want to have to drive around um, Las Vegas looking for a, a propane tank refill. Um, we paid extra, as I mentioned previously, about dishes for dishes and bedding. And then you didn't have to pay for the mileage, but um, mileage, unlimited miles was included in ours. Um, the reason I mentioned that unlimited miles is because some places, um, some rental companies will charge, they have a daily mileage limit. Maybe it's 100 miles a day or 110 miles a day or 105 miles a day. They, and if they're all cumulative, but, um, but if you go over it, so, you know, if you have, like, if you're going for a certain number of days and maybe you don't drive for one or two days, but you, you, you're total driving is like, you know, a thousand miles for 10 days and you have a hundred mile um, a day limit, then you're, you're okay. But, um, but if not, you'll get charged those extra miles. And I had been hearing about reading about for people just talking about that, that adds up really fast. So we just didn't want to have to think about it. Um, so unlimited miles was a bonus. I think we drove just under a thousand miles, so we would have been fine, but um, it would have nice to not have to think about it. Also in our um, rental, we got a three month trial to the Dirt Pro app, which was really nice. I have the Dirt app, but I don't have the Pro. And for those who don't know, if you're not familiar with the Pro, that's good for finding, you can use that offline when you're in an area like Utah that you don't have cell service or internet connection you can still find the dispersed um, camping and, and other things that you're looking for related to that um, offline. So that's a bonus. All right, so that kind of wraps up the, the nuts and bolts of, the, of our um, presentation. And now we're just gonna show you a few scenic pictures from our trip. We are at Bryce Canyon, or I think this is early morning. Bryce Canyon. I, I should mention, so we went to, I think I had mentioned, we went to, um, we went to two national parks, which were Zion and Bryce. Um, we didn't spend a lot of time in Zion, uh, specifically because we knew this time of year that when we were going, it, Zion was just a zoo. We did actually end up camping. We, we lucked out and got a campsite in Zion um, one night one of our first nights of, at the beginning of our trip. And um, I got up early in the morning and I was walking around and I walked by the parking lot for the shuttle. It was barely eight o'clock in the morning and the cars were already circling, looking for parking spaces. The parking lot was already packed full at eight o'clock in the morning. And there were just throngs of people like a it was like a bus just unloaded, throngs of people walking across the bridge, coming into the park to go to get onto the shuttle. Um, and I just thought, oh, I'm so glad, you know, so it, we'd already made that decision before we to not go into Zion Canyon. We did explore lesser known parts of Zion National Park, which I would highly recommend. Um, but being in Zion and seeing all these people really kind of solidified, yep, we made the right decision. So we'll go back another time, maybe in um, February when there's no people. <laughs> well, there's fewer people. Zion what is month were you there? Uh, we were there in um, September, the end of September to the um, beginning of, of, of October. September 26th to October 4th. Um, so anyway, so, and then we ended up, we ended up um, 
so we stayed one night in in Zion and then we we both really um since we hadn't been to this area we both really were drawn to Bryce and um the beauty of Bryce of what we had seen so we kind of just made a beeline after leaving um Zion and um headed right to Bryce and got a campsite because the campground that we were looking at um didn't have reservations and I wanted to at least spend one night and one morning in Bryce for the sunset and for the sunrise. Um, and we did, and we loved it so much, we actually stayed four nights. <laughs> so it was great. And um, it worked out well. We were still living off the grid because we didn't have electrical or water hookups where we were. And um, we could come, you know, we just came, came and went as we pleased. We had beautiful dark sky nights. It was awesome. The stars were amazing. Um, and it was, um, a little chilly. One morning we woke up, it was 28 degrees. We have no heat in our camper van. Um, and you could see your breath. So it was really pleasant. It was very nice to be able to walk to the um, indoor bathrooms and they had hot running water. <laughs> no showers, which was fine, but just to wash your hands in hot water was really a treat when it was 28 degrees that morning. We had plenty of warm clothing, but it's a little bit of a shock. So that's so um, that's one of the reasons why we did not need to use our number two briefcase is because we ended up um, spending more nights than we had anticipated in in Bryce. But it was it was so beautiful. And another thing, just to mention about that, um, we have I'm I'm lucky that one of my benefits of being married to Randy is that he's over sixty two. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we get the the um, the geezer pass and, um, and with the, the geezer pass, um, <coughs> not only can you get into the, as you may know, not only can you get into the national parks for free, but, um, but you also get a discount on camping. So when we were getting our campsite for, um, for Bryce, uh, we, you know, couldn't order it online. We were just filling it out and the, the camp host happened to walk by and we asked him, hey, how much is it for the campsite? And he asked us, he looked at our van and he said, oh, do you have a toilet? And we said, no, we do not. <laughs> Technically, we did not have a toilet. It did not come with a toilet. So we said, no. And he said, oh, okay, then you're the same price as a, as a tent, which is $20 a night. So with Randy's 50% discount, we stayed there for $10 a night. So that was a sweet deal. So it never hurts to ask if you've got one of those, um, you know, and if you're in a camper van and you don't have a toilet, there are benefits to not having a toilet. You can save even extra money, which pays for the gas. Uh -huh. Okay, there. There's just more of this Thor's hammer. This is part of the Navajo Trail, hiking down into the canyon or the amphitheater. And I should say all of, all of these photographs that you're seeing now are all um, Randy's handiwork. Maura Bryce. This is scenic highway 12. You can kind of see how it snakes here and then it comes down around and goes up. It's, um, it's rated, I guess, as like the second most scenic highway in, in the country. And um, I can see why it's beautiful. And there are parts of it where you just, it just drops off and you just have this, amazing moon rock kind of moonscape forever. This is looking out onto the Grand Staircase. Um, this is a hike that we did in Lower Calf Creek and Grand Staircase um, Escalante National Monument. And these are um, pictographs. pictographs here. And the interesting thing about this is that these are not actually, um, I, I, I still don't know how they got there because, I mean, how the people got there because you can see there's, this looks like a ledge, but it's not really. And it's actually quite high up um, from, uh, from the ground. So we, we never, we didn't get anywhere near it. So we couldn't tell what kind of an angle it was on that slope. So it looks yeah. like it's a, it's a pretty high angle slope. So it would have taken some effort to get up there. To draw away. Yeah, this is with a really super telephoto lens. And then we hiked to the end of the hike was going to the lower Calf Creek Falls, which was a beautiful area. And it's a spring fed um, uh, creek. So the, the water, there's always water. There's always water in the falls. It's just stunningly beautiful. It was chilly, but it was beautiful. 
And then we had wildlife. You know, when you go out to the, you know, into the Southwest, you expect to see things like, you know, maybe, um, well, we did see some elk and maybe some bighorn sheep um, or other things. Um, but, um, but we saw cows, lots of cows all over, everywhere we went, we saw cows. And here we were even in the middle of a roundup. And here's a little fun video for you. I'm just going to back this up for a second because I just want to point out a couple of things about this fun. Apparently in Utah, it's legal to, to, um, to ride and, and to drink and ride. <laughs> and this guy, notice what he has in his shirt. He's got his little puppy dog. <laughs> anyway, it was hilarious. So there you go. So, and this is, um, then we went over to Cedar Breaks National Monument. Beautiful. While we were there, this is about 10,400 feet. Um, it snowed. <laughs> this was on October 3rd. Just a little bit of snow, just a little pelts, not much, but it did snow. And I think like three or four days later, we, um, I, I saw on Facebook that um, it, the road had been completely covered with snow. So it, it didn't take long in higher elevations. Ah, and then it's just another farewell to the Bryce Canyon and Joshua Tree. We saw lots of Joshua trees in um, the Red Rock Canyon and Nas National Conservation Area near um, Nevada. So, all right, well, that's it. Any questions? Thank you. I'm going to stop sharing so now I can see people. Were you pretty happy with the size of your camper van or? Would you uh, would you consider going to a larger one next time, or you just you like it the way it was? I think it was pretty good the way it was, and uh, I was satisfied with it. It did require us to shift back and forth between each other. You know, one had to move in order to make a space, so the other could get at something that they needed to get at. But generally speaking, it was uh, you know we managed. We're used to that um, in. And, you know, we were working in a small kitchen sometimes. And so, you know, it's not a, a big problem. But if you if you didn't work well together, I guess it could be a problem. <laughs> we liked it. I loved it. I, you know, um, it, it would be nice to have, you know, maybe a toilet in. in but um, but yeah. the was, size of the van was perfect. We loved it. We loved having a camper van. It was like, I think this was probably one of the best vacations I've been on. And it was just so easy. We didn't have to really think about anything because everything was with us. And that was one of the advantages so, of having the camper van is everything is there with you. You just stop, hop in the back, you know, and um, make make something to eat. And there was, and there was plenty of storage space in that particular van and probably any, any type of van that you might rent from any other uh, vendor could, would probably have at least that much space, maybe more. If you had a bigger one, obviously. That sounds good. And it was highly maneuverable compared to a great big uh, motorhome, right? So yes. Yes. yes, much better because it's a, it's like an extra long van size and a little extra tall. Uh, so it did get taken in, you know, if there's a side wind, we noticed it. Um, it kind of pushed you around the road a little bit because of the height. Um, but uh, generally it handled well, it, it had enough power, it was a Chevrolet, and it had enough power to get um, you know, up hills, um, but we weren't the first one to arrive. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Yep, you're welcome. I see a question here. Um, there might be others that I'm just trying to lead through. I see a question um, from, I think, Tina. Did we find the camper van experience somewhat isolating? Not very much interaction with others. No, we did not because we did have interaction with others. Um, and, um, you know, we had interaction with, I guess, people who were in, in the campgrounds or on the trails. Um, but I mean, no, we didn't. 
we loved it. But um, by the same token, the reason for that is because we went to parks that were not completely empty. We didn't, um, I mean, we did go to the Escalante uh, area and we were kind of away from people there, but we never, we weren't there for so long that we started feeling like, you know, let's get back to humanity. <laughs> yeah, and actually I think, you know, if we were, um, if we'd had our own van and we were able to go down some of these deserted roads, we I we both would be quite fine with that. And if we didn't see people for a few days, we wouldn't it, we wouldn't be that wouldn't be a terrible loss. That's right. We're, good we're on that. vacation, you know. <laughs> we like people, but um, you know. But we also like to get away from. People. We like to hike and yeah. The crowd, you know. yeah. Hey, Christy, Ray has his hand up. <laughs> Hey, I was just wondering, you talked about no gravel roads with the rental. That seems super hard on Bureau of Land Management. How'd you guys, how, how did you navigate that? Well, the, the rule that they gave us when we sat down and actually talked with them about it, because when we read the rule, it looked like, well, we just can't go down many of the places that we might want to. But when we, when we talked to them about it, he told us no, and then we reread the rule, and it actually said no dirt road. And dirt roads are different from gravel roads. But we encountered a number of gravel roads, and we figured by the letter of that rule, the letter of the law, gravel is okay, but dirt is not. And and that makes sense too if you think about it. When there's a, a heavy rain or a, a you know, in, in the desert area, when there's a rain, there can be a flood. Uh, just with not a, doesn't need to be a whole lot of rain to get a, a, a flood. And if you're on dirt, well, then that's, that's going to be mud that you can't get through, no matter whether you have a four wheel drive or not, you won't be able to get through it. But if there's, uh, if you're on gravel, you can probably still get down that road even during the rain, unless parts get washed out. Uh, but what we figured out was that, uh, well, and what do you, the guy, the rental guy told us that um, you really can't go down the dirt roads because if anything happened, you'd be stuck and you wouldn't be able to get a tow truck down there because they will not go down dirt roads, but they will go down gravel roads. So that differentiated the two types of road. Um, it makes it more feasible. So I think it really depends too on, on the type of driver you are, you know, and if you're a safe and cautious driver. Um, but it does say, so I think checking with the rental agreement, and I, I've heard, you know, plenty of rental cars. I never knew this, but it's in the rental agreement. You cannot take rental cars down. No dirt roads, no off, no non-pavement roads. And uh, yeah, it's like- Unless you rent a Jeep. Well, but, specifically but even, for that. yeah, but so, so um, I never knew that. And, and I've heard stories of, of rangers telling us about, you know, parts of cars that they find on some of these roads. But, um, but yeah, I think it's just really it's check with the, the rental company or who you're renting it from. You know, I can see both sides of the story, the part of the picture or whatever. So. Yeah. Made sense. 